off, but I think maybe some people joining us from other organisations, so um, welcome to you as well. Um, my name, for those of you that don't know me, um, is Vicky Wad. I work for um, NHS Friendly, the ICB, and lead on the wellbeing agenda for the organisation. Um, but we obviously reach out into the system, work with a lot of system partners as well. As I've said, World Menopause Day is tomorrow. Um, those of you that follow All Matters Menopause, as um, certainly I do, and so I'm sure a lot of you do, there's been a lot of national um, and regional work on this, a lot of publicity, a um, lot of celebrities working behind the scenes to raise awareness of menopause um, and the support that's available to it. And what we just wanted to do today was to provide a space for people to um, come together and hear from uh, both Dr Lalitha Ayer and Miss Anne Deans um, about some of the um, considerations around menopause that we ought to be taking into account and thinking about how we can um, either look after ourselves better um, during this time or support other people um, to look after themselves better. So that's the purpose of today. Um, I just wanted to reflect on a lot of the negative stuff that sometimes people talk about menopause and actually think about um, the Japanese approach to menopause, which is very much about thinking about this as being a new stage in people's lives um, and a stage of renewal and change and difference. So um, not quite nice. I quite like to think about things like that in that kind of light. But I'm going to hand over now to um, Lalitha and to Anne to introduce themselves and take us through this session. Thank you so much for supporting us. Thank you. So, um, Anne, do you want to introduce yourself first? And as I'm speaking first, I will then introduce myself and launch off into the talk. OK, well, look, thank you very much for uh, having me come to your lunchtime meeting today. I'm Anne Deans and I'm a consultant in obstetrics and gynaecology. I've been at Frimley Health since 1994 and I'm the chief of service for obstetrics and gynaecology too. So um, I'm, uh, uh, I, I'm passionate about the menopause. I'm afraid I don't regard the menopause as a very nice time and, uh, <laughs> but I can hear what you're saying and that we should celebrate it. And hopefully we all can by um, having the right approach and, and, and access to the right uh, uh, treatment for it. So I shall hand over to Lalitha. Thank you. It's really nice to see all of you here today. So I'm Lalitha Ayer. I'm the Chief Medical Officer for the Frimley ICB. But um, with regard to this topic of menopause, I'd just like to say I've been working as a gynecologist in Wexham Park Hospital since 1993, so a long time. Um, after which I left Wexham Park to become a GP with special interests. I'm an accredited menopause specialist, so I see a lot of women in the community, and believe it or not, about 5 to 10 percent of the consultations that we see in the GP land in women who are between the age of 45 and 65 are related in some form or shape to menopause. And that's actually quite a staggering number. They come not necessarily with the traditional symptoms of menopause, but various things. And when you actually take the time to talk to them, you find it's the menopause that's bothering them in this particular way. So I'm also here from a point of view of trying to make our ICB a menopause friendly place. So to that extent, towards the end of this session, I'd like some ideas from you as to how we get feedback from you to change and make our organization a menopause friendly uh, workplace. So what I wanted to do today and what Anne and I have planned is that I will start off the session by talking a little bit about menopause uh, in a general sense and Anne will then focus on uh, treatments and just to give you an awareness of it's not that we're going to prescribe for any of you but at least you know what options there may be when you go and speak to your health professional in your own practices. So um, could I just get a sense today if I look at the names I don't think there are any men with us but that's fine. Um, would any of you mind sharing if you're above the age of 45 and put your hands up only if you want to if you don't want to that's fine you can put your virtual hand up if you don't want to show me your face and uh, my hand is up as well i guess thank you so i'm going to start us off with a little bit of a presentation just to guide us through uh, some thoughts i'm going to share my screen and if one of you can tell me when you can see my screen 
Yes, I can say it. Thanks, Letha. So we need, uh, and can you see it in um, slideshow mode? Yes, thanks. OK, so pink, um, I just thought, let me go bold and bright. Um, we know, as Vicky said, World Menopause um, Day is on the 18th of October. And I guess as more and more awareness of menopause spreads, this World Menopause Day will take away the stigma, make us have conversations about menopause, and hopefully each and every woman will get the right information and the right help at the time they need. And I'm hoping uh, conversations between ourselves, on television, and from various organizations like the British Menopause Society will guide us here. So we know that Davina launched uh, us all into a lot of um, conversations about menopause with her um, television program. And I suppose HRT can't make all of us look like she does. We, uh, many of my patients will say, how can I look like Davina? And actually, um, it's not really that easy. She is working hard at it. But thanks to Davina, um, menopause and um, sexual difficulty around menopause, the various myths, etc., have been um, point of conversations, open conversations. We also know that last year there was a women's health strategy that was launched by the government. The first ever, I think, um, you know, on the International Women's Day last year, sometime in June, it promised to be the first ever women's health strategy written in UK. It's been published and there are a lot of recommendations from here, which we will go through in a moment. But we've also got people like Caroline Harris, who is the MP who leads on the uh, menopause uh, parliamentary group. And I had the good fortune of meeting her at the recent summer uh, British Menopause Society annual conference. And she actually held a round table with many of us who were working um, as menopause specialists. And one of the suggestions we made to her, uh, because she feels that HRT should be easily available, it should be free uh, for women so that it, there's no postcode lottery and it's not as if only the affluent can afford HRT. But she was also asking us as a group of GPs um, how we could enable access to the conversation for menopause. And one of the suggestions we all made to her at that point was that primary care does uh, what is called an NHS health check, where we traditionally check for the physical markers. We check if their blood pressure is normal. Do they have diabetes? We take a history of stroke, history of cardiac disease and so on. And why not actually get an EMIS template sorted so that there's a traditional question saying, are your periods regular? Do you have any hot flushes? Do you actually have no periods? Do you feel, you know, you want to have a conversation about menopause? So that if the answer to any of that was yes, they, the nurse or the HCA doing that test could then signpost them to the right place, even if they didn't feel that they could have that conversation there and then. And I'm pleased to note that she has taken some of this on board. And there is a view that GP should be offering this as a regular check. She's also rallying various people, MPs, as you see here, around the all parliamentary group and saying, let's join the menopause revolution because the more heavyweights we have behind this conversation, the better for women. So I just wanted to actually start a little bit by talking about the reproductive cycle in women because once you understand this, you then know what menopause is. So. On the left, you can see the uterus, the two ovaries, which produce the hormones estrogen and progesterone. We have a lining of the uterus, which is the endometrium which, within the cavity of the uterus. Now, on the right, you see the magic of, a, of the menstrual cycle. And actually, if you think about it and look at it and read about it, this is like an orchestra within our body and it's a it's almost a miracle the way these hormones work so you'll see various lines so you see the purple line here which is the estrogen which initially comes up in order to make the lining of the uterus grow thicker you then have another hormone that comes up called the lh which is the one in blue which then enables ovulation to happen which then releases a third hormone that is seen in green called progesterone. And the sum and substance of this is that the lining of the uterus then in the second half of the menstrual cycle is ready for a pregnancy, should it happen. If a pregnancy does not happen, then both hormones, all the hormones fall in a cyclical way, usually in a month, following which 
a woman has a period. So a period basically is the support to the lining of the uterus being lost because the hormones go down. So each month the woman has a period associated usually with ovulation and menopause is the point of the last period occurring. So this is the magic that happens for most of us up to the age of 51. And so what is the actual menopause? So the menopause is a normal physiological transition in females. It's part of aging. It's defined as the end of the female reproductive function, which means that that's the last period a woman has generally um, considered that you can't get pregnant, although we do have certain contraceptive recommendations around the age of menopause. And although menopause can happen between the age of 45 and 55, the average age in the UK is 51. There's a small number of women who may have early menopause, either because they've had their ovaries taken out as part of uh, hysterectomy or part of other surgery, like cysts, etc., or they have it induced because of various medications they've taken for cancer or otherwise. But we all know that Although menopause as a particular event is a last period, for many years before that, could be two years, could be more, could be up to 10 years, women do find that their periods are slightly irregular. They may have a few changes which may stop and start. So people may have slightly irregular periods and then it all gets better and then the periods get longer again, sometimes heavier. And that period is called the perimenopause that happens before the menopause and postmenopause is clearly the period after the menopause. And we know that there's lot, many, many symptoms you will hear people talking about during the menopause. And we know that 88% of women or majority of the women are symptomatic with menopause. And one in four women having severe symptoms from menopause, it could be fatigue, it could be hot flushes, it could be night sweats, various things as you see in the background. And we also know that when you are symptomatic, the woman is more likely to have issues with being productive at work. And as, as it said, low workability was the term that they were using in the conference. There are a lot of myths and actually facts about the menopause as well. So uh, sometimes people think, oh, it begins very early. It doesn't. It usually ranges, like I said, at the far end of the reproductive cycle. You can still enjoy sex, but there may be decreased libido and there are things you can do. It's not a disease. It's a natural part of the aging process. And hot flushes are not the first warning sign in all women. There can be other signs as well, and the signs and symptoms could be random. There's no particular order in each woman. The way she reacts to lack of estrogen is different. And Many people think, oh, it's only physical symptoms. Not at all. There are so many mental symptoms. And actually, in some women, the mental symptoms of menopause can be more um, frustrating than the physical symptoms. So physically, a woman could complain of hot flushes where you're sitting in a room, everybody else seems very comfortable, and suddenly you feel really hot. You want to go to the door, you want to open the window, the door, and uh, some of you here might have experienced that kind of symptom. Sometimes your partner is very comfortable in bed and here you are throwing all the sheets away because you are really hot. You want the fan on, he wants it off and um, it's, a, it's a common scenario at this age group. All of this clearly leads to disturbed sleep. This could also be associated, like I said earlier, with period problems where the period is either heavy or there are um, mood changes along with that. And often women will complain of headaches, joint pain, not feeling themselves. And longer term, one can have things like osteoporosis and heart health issues because of lack of estrogen. Similarly, loss of libido might be felt in the early stages, but as the lack of estrogen goes on, women will also report feeling a sensation of real dryness in the vagina, urinary symptoms like wanting to go quite often in the night or even in the day, there's a sensation of urgency or wanting to rush to the toilet. And all of these is predominantly because the, the bladder sits on the vagina. And if the vagina is dry and lacking in estrogen, bladder symptoms can actually be one of the symptoms of menopause. Like I said before, psychological symptoms can be quite troublesome. Mood changes. The menopausal woman is a bit like a premenstrual woman, but sometimes um, irritability, fatigue and anxiety takes the predominant uh, becomes the predominant symptom. Difficulty concentrating and brain fog is really 
um, seen more and more now and women are coming out with it. I remember I had a patient who used to work um, at Waitrose in the till. And she would say to me, she's got a customer, she's put all the things through, She's uh, the bill has come out, she's given it to the customer, the customer's given her a note, she's put the note into the till, and for a minute she can't remember if that was a £20 note or a £10 note, and she used to find it so frustrating. Similarly, many women will say they've gone into a room to pick up a thing, and they've reached the room, but can't remember what they actually walked in there for. And in their mind, they've got to backtrack what happened, where did they start in a different room, what did they come here for? These are typically the brain fog scenarios, and it's really not uncommon at all, and may ring a bell with some of you. And what's actually the global relevance? We know that globally, more than 50% of women actually are at work during this menopausal transition, which means that not only are we are we struggling with home scenarios where you may have elderly parents who are not well, you may have children who are uh, just transitioning out of university or towards the end of university. And one of my patients said, we, we are the double whammy generation where you kind of give yourself, give off yourself to everybody else. And then when menopause comes, that's just not sustainable because you need to make yourself a priority. Women have always given more to others. Um, and this is a time when I think we do need to prioritize. We know that um, the numbers of people with menopausal symptoms will increase. The diagnosis is predominantly clinical. But as Vicky said right at the start, we know there are massive cultural differences. So in countries like Japan, menopause is not a big thing. HRT is not um, not really uh, that much of an ask. However, their dietary needs, uh, dietary habits are actually slightly different. They may be consuming more natural estrogens, phytoestrogens that are available in things like beans, pulses, and so on. Similarly, I was thinking back of my mom. I don't think she ever spoke about hot flushes or menopause. But she was severely osteoporotic by the time she was 80. So um, we've got to think about the cultural influences in the way women um, feel the lack of estrogen. And we do know that in terms of workplace, and there is a lot of focus on the workplace now, and that's a really good thing. Many are leaving or changing their jobs because they're not able to cope in the workplace. And the current state of affairs, as we know, is that 75% of our NHS workforce is women. There is a large number of women, nearly three quarter of women over 45 in the NHS find that it affects their work, but they are not able to talk about this as often. It's a taboo subject and managers actually don't know what to do about it. If someone says oh, I've got menopausal symptoms, they can cope more easily with a broken arm or a broken leg. And so we know that menopause can affect each woman's work by affecting the quality of work. They are unable to learn new tasks and therefore things like promotions, which they would have well deserved, doesn't seem to be forthcoming. The brain fog doesn't help. They can't actually pay attention to little detail. Not only are they sometimes absent using, absent using their own you know, annual leave, they're not present really in the full state that they ought to be present. And therefore, when you take time off, there's not just the impact on the woman, but actually, if you look at the work days lost, it's quite a lot as well. And a US um, study projected that loss of productivity could be as high as 150 billion a year. So it's a real problem. And I think when Ipsos Mori conducted a study on women's experiences at work, they said 47% of the women said that they were actually taking their annual leave days to cope with the symptoms. They felt they were unable to disclose why they were taking leave to their manager. So they might actually say, I've got a bit of a temperature, but actually it's just that they are not able to cope at work because they felt that their seniors would label them as weak, incompetent, oh, she's a bit depressed, she's a bit unstable, those sort of things. So, and and the irony is they do not ask for little accommodation at work where we accommodate for various things, including things like faith, for example. If someone wants to pray, we accommodate a lot of things. Uh, some places accommodate things like smoking. But when somebody has menopausal symptoms, they do not seem to ask for accommodation within their job plan. So a little bit of quick summary in numbers, really. We know that 13 million women in the UK are going through or have reached the menopause. And that's really, if you think about it, one in three women. One in four of them say that it does affect the quality of their life. And even after 15 years of menopause, some women do have problems. And we do see women presenting to us now in general practice at the age of 60, 65, not uncommon with some symptoms. And 
most clinicians are then very reluctant to start things like HRT in an older woman. They do it more easily in a slightly younger population. And we know that longer term, the risk of cardiovascular doubles with early menopause if it's not treated. We know that menopause doubles the woman's risk of osteoporotic fractures. My mom was an example of that. Women say very openly now that they don't know enough about HRT to make an informed choice. So this whole movement of menopause, change the change. There are a lot of um, information sites and the British Menopause Society has a women's health forum, which is the patient arm um, of the British Menopause Society and is really worth membership. There's a free newsletter that comes every time and I would urge each and every one of you to look at the website. So as far as I'm concerned, from an organizational point of view, Women are a really talented, experienced cohort of the working population, and yet most are quite silent. And I want us to be a menopause friendly workplace that allows women to feel comfortable talking about their problems and feel supported so that they can continue to be their most productive self at work. And as far as managing your menopause and treating the treating your symptoms are concerned. It's just what we all know. Uh, we know, you know, to give up smoking, to cut down on alcohol, try and balance our hormones by eating healthy, moving gently, uh, having reasonably good sleeping habits and relaxing and reducing stress. So we know all of these and we'll touch a little on how and what to focus on, a little on the alternative therapies that are available as well in the second part of the talk. Um, this is again just um, a summary of how you will find a, you'll find plenty of information online, but please do go to the um, dedicated websites and the British Menopause Society is one that I would highly recommend um, that you all go to. And this is our end goal. We'd all like to feel as relaxed and as chilled as this. And at this point, I'm going to hand over to Anne to take us through some of the measures that we could use. And I'm hoping that after this, we'll have a bit of time where we stop recording and then we have a safe space to talk about anything you might wish to talk about. I'll stop here, stop sharing in a minute. Yeah, and Anne. I'll, I'll share my screen. There we are. Can you see my slides now? Thank you. Yes. OK, so, well, um, I'm very pleased that you've asked me to come and uh, speak on uh, World Menopause Day. It is tomorrow, but I'm absolutely passionate about um, treating the menopause, because if you think about it, um, you are going to go through the menopause. The average age is 51 and most of us live until we're in our 80s. So you've got 30 years to be in a postmenopausal state. And um, that's a time when I think a lot of women do miss out not getting any treatment for it. And I think the importance of World Menopause Day is to raise awareness, break the stigma of the menopause, and really support the options that we've got available to make sure that women's health and well being isn't disadvantaged by becoming menopausal. And in fact, it's not just a gender, a gender or an age issue, it, it's an organization issue. We all need to know about it. And as, as Lalitha said, you know, we've got 3.5 million women over 50 in the workplace in the UK. And, you know, we do make up um, in the NHS 77%. Um, so three quarters of, of the workforce in the NHS is uh, a, 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 a women and a significant number will be menopausal. So the menopause is when natural part of aging. Yes, I agree. It's a natural part of aging because estrogen levels decline. But the problem is estrogen isn't just coming from the ovaries and giving you menstrual periods. Estrogen is vital for a number of parts of you functioning normally. So, yes, menopause is easy to say I've become menopausal because my menstrual periods have become irregular and then they stop. But the thing that first gets a lot of women is the hot flushes and night sweats. They're quite debilitating and they often start occurring before the last menstrual period. So I've had women say they've got hot flushes and night sweats when they're in their early to mid 40s and yet their periods don't stop until they get into their 50s. The worst problem I think for a lot of women is the mood changes, anxiety, the memory, the lack of concentration, because again, estrogen is a vital hormone in your brain. 
and not to be sniffed at is the vaginal dryness, the urinary frequency and the lack of libido. Women have had their marriages destroyed by the fact that they don't want to have sex. And if they do try and have sex, they've got vaginal dryness because estrogen is a vital hormone for, for ensuring that the vagina is moist and well estrogenized. If you've got a if you've got dryness in the vaginal area, it's painful to have sex. You simply don't want to have sex. And that's that's worse than not than than the, the lack of libido in, in some instances. The other thing that a lot of women report, and I have to say I've had personal thing of this, is the joint and muscle stiffness. You get out of bed in the morning and you can hardly get into the bathroom because your joints ache. And a lot of women get more migraine because remember that a lot of women get menstrual migraine. At the time of their menstrual period, when estrogen levels are low, that's when their migraine tends to cluster. So I've seen women in the menopause find their migraine gets worse. So I would just say to you all, look at this graph here, that in your teens and until you get into being about 50, estrogen levels are high. And then when you get after the change, estrogen levels become virtually zero unless you take HRT. Now think of how well you feel during the month. Most of us, when we're having menstrual periods, feel best in the middle of the monthly cycle. About If you count from your period as day zero and um, you know, the first day of your period as day one, and then um, when your period starts again as day 28, most of us feel best around day 10, day 12, day 14, mid-cycle. And that's when estrogen levels are higher. So I think that... Um, the problem that we've forgotten is that most women do feel better in a high estrogen environment. And the problem with the perimenopause is that often at that stage, estrogen levels are a lot more variable. Cycles are more irregular. They're not ovulating. So women start to get symptoms due to lack of estrogen many years sometimes before the menopause actually occurs, which is when ovulation and ovaries stop working completely. So Postmenopause may be 12 months after the time when your period stopped, but women are getting symptoms before then. And as Lalitha said, you know, if you think that three out of five women between the ages of 45 and 55 are experiencing menopausal symptoms, and that's having a negative impact at work, that's a significant number of the population. And, you know, nearly two thirds of women in that age group in, in a study done by the Chartered Institute of Personal personnel and development, uh, two thirds of women were saying they were less able to concentrate during those ages due to menopausal symptoms. They were more stressed. They were taking sick leave, but few of them were able to tell their managers at work why they were feeling this way. And I think the big problem in the menopause that women find at work is their cognition and their mood. They get this brain fog. They have memory difficulties. They're not sleeping. They've got low mood. And some of them get very worried that they're actually going dippy or they're getting dementia. I've had many women say to me, I'm going mad. I'm getting dementia early. I'm going like my mother. I can't remember things. I go into a room to go and get something and I can't remember why I'm there. Or at work, I'm giving a task. I start doing it and then I can't remember what I was asked to do. So this change in mood and cognition at the time of the menopause and afterwards is a true effect due to estrogen. And it's sometimes difficult to squeeze out how much is the effect of estrogen on the brain and how much of it is due to the fact that people are getting hot flushes, they're getting poor sleep, they're not able to concentrate. But we know there are estrogen receptors in the brain that affect cognitive function. And we know that during the menopause, if you put someone into a false menopause by taking out their ovaries or you suppress estrogen with medications such as injections, we find that, that, and you do tests on them, their verbal learning and their memory deteriorates. So lack of estrogen, you're not able to learn as well, and you don't have such good memory. And you can reverse that by giving estrogen. So we know that the decline of estrogen is likely to contribute to problems with learning and your working memory. And that means that after the menopause or as the menopause approaches, you will find you will not be as good at learning things, at remembering things, 
and being and at work. So, you know, to improve cognitive health, I'm not saying estrogen is the whole answer. There's a lot of other things you can do. We know that you can, if you take 150 minutes of exercise a week, you'll boost your brain. We know that weight plays a part. We know that diet plays a part. We know that smoking and alcohol all play a part. But I maintain that having good levels of estrogen also will improve your cognitive health and your memory once you get to the age of approaching the menopause. A lot's talked about natural remedies. Now, I saw Lalith put that up. I'm afraid I am not very pro all these natural remedies. I think there is little scientific evidence that taking things like sage or evening primrose oil or red clover works. There is evidence that stuff called isoflavins and black coash may relieve the hot flushes and night sweats, but they're all packaged in, in, in an unregimented way. We have no real scientific evidence that these work, and much more importantly, there is no regulation around the herbal and the health food um, uh, 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 industry. So we don't know what's in all this stuff that's sold over the counter. And there is evidence that black coash can interfere with some of the antidepressant medications that GPs may be prescribing. So I'm afraid in my eyes as a clinician, and you may say, well, she's a doctor, she's bound to think that. I feel that hormone replacement therapy is the most effective way to treat menopausal symptoms. And the reason I'm absolutely convinced is not only that Davina has told me that, uh, but also when we had a huge shortage of HRT recently, there was a supply problem. Women took to the streets to complain about it. And um, it, you know, there was a huge upset about the fact that women couldn't get their HRT supplies and suffered. It happened about 18 months ago. Um, there was a supply problem during COVID. And you can see that um, women became very distressed that they were not able to take their normal um, HRT preparations. And as uh, Lalitha um, alluded to, there's been an APPG group which has supported the fact that women should have a checkup at 45 to get a check to see whether they should be taking HRT or considering it. And it's clear that a lot of women are being, uh, are being denied access to HRT. They're going to GPs who may not be sympathetic or they're not being given the full um, information about what HRT might do for them, what types of HRT. Some of them are being given antidepressants. And that really upsets me because we know that, yes, they may be depressed at that time in life, but the NICE guidelines say that women suffering from menopause symptoms should not be prescribed antidepressants. They should be given HRT. And I think it's perfectly reasonable to consider should women be being charged for HRT, being given prescription charges. It used to be you had to pay double the prescription charge um, because they contain two sorts of hormones, estrogen and progesterone. But I would also say that HRT has long term benefits, osteoporosis. We know that in any NHS hospital, you're up to one in 10 of the beds are taken up by women suffering from osteoporosis problems notably fractured neck of femur. And if we could prevent those, we would actually reduce the number of women breaking their hips and ending up in hospital. It improves your skin, your collagen. It helps you gain more muscle mass. And as I say, for me, it really helped my migraine. I used to get terrible migraines to do with low estrogen levels. By having a good level of estrogen in my blood circulation, my migraine is, is much improved. So I guess we go back to the big problem that everybody worries about is breast cancer. And just to say that one of the problems we have in the HRT world is that the level of breast cancer increases roughly about the time when people are becoming menopausal. And you're probably aware it's the commonest cancer among women. And one of the issues is does HRT cause breast cancer? And actually, if you look at HRT and whether it causes breast cancer or not, we do know that combined HRT that's HRT that contains estrogen progesterone does increase the risk for breast cancer, but the risk is very small. It's about one extra cancer per thousand women each year. So the increased risk is lowest if you're lean and, and you're not overweight. Um, and of course, if you have a late menopause or an early um, onset of your periods, then actually it's the length of time that you're 
that you've got estrogen in your circulation. So if you if you avoid being obese and you avoid drinking a large amount of alcohol, that is better for you and reduces your risk um, for getting breast cancer than it does from stopping taking HRT. So if you have a look at this picture, it, it's a bit hard if you can decipher it. We see that in a thousand women, there will be 23 cases of breast cancer in the population. If you take HRT over those thousand women, you get an extra four women. But actually, if you look, uh, you get an, um, you also get an additional number of women if you're on the pill. But look at this, if you get an extra five cases, if you drink two or more units of alcohol a week uh, uh, per day. So if you want to reduce your risk of breast cancer, stay on HRT, but don't drink. I only drink on a Saturday and I only allow myself two units a week. If you're a smoker, but look at being overweight. If you are overweight, we have an extra 24 cases per thousand women in the obese or overweight group. So the key here, if you want to reduce your risk for breast cancer, isn't to stay off HRT, it's to stop being overweight. And that is the biggest message we can give, that breast cancer is related to being overweight, alcohol, our stressors more than the effect of HRT. And also if you exercise, you do your two and a half hours a week, you we see seven fewer cases per thousand women who are taking the amount of exercise that the NHS um, recommends. So I would say that's much more important. So I'm a big person in prescribing HRT. How can you take HRT? Well, if you've had a hysterectomy, you only need to take estrogen. But if you still have your uterus, then you need to take estrogen and progesterone. Estrogen is the hormone you need to make to stop all the menopausal symptoms, both the acute things and the long term things. But if you just take estrogen only, that causes the lining of your womb to build up. And as a result, you could get a small number of women will get a cancer of the lining of the womb. So if you're still got your womb, you have to take estrogen and progesterone. If you're within a year of your period, we give you the estrogen and the progesterone so that we mimic a menstrual cycle. It's called the so-called sequential regime. Every month you have a period like bleed. But once you've been more than a year after the menopause, you can take the estrogen and progesterone together and you don't have to have a bleed at all. And that can be taken either orally or it can be taken as a patch or you can take a patch and a tablet. So the oral type of HRT contains the estrogen progesterone as a tablet. Transdermal, you put a patch on, and you can see in this picture, the patient has a patch on her leg, and in that patch is estrogen, and it's absorbed through the skin. She can have the patch containing estrogen and progesterone, or she can have the transdermal patch which she puts on, and she takes a natural form of progestogen at night. And the reason that we tend to prescribe it at night is because eutrogestion, which is currently our favorite form of progesterone, it's a natural progesterone, it does make you feel a bit sleepy. So it does help with sleeping at night. The other type of progesterone you can have is you can have a coil containing the progesterone, which I'll show you in a minute. And that provides your protection for your womb lining. Some women around the time of the menopause, if they're still having periods and they're under 50, they actually find that the oral contraceptive pill is helpful because, in fact, HRT contains exactly the same type of hormones as the oral contraceptive pill. The big difference is that the oral contraceptive pill has synthetic type estrogen, whereas the HRT contains a natural form. So these are the different types we have the if you haven't got a uterus you can take estrogen all the time if you do have your uterus you can either take a continuous sequential type of hrt regime where you have a period every month or if you're more than a year after the last menstrual period you can take estrogen progesterone together and you don't have to have a period and here are the roots you can take either a tablet you can take patches or what i favor i like the gel um, what happens with the gel is that you um, you have like a, a, a canister, you squirt a um, blob of the gel into your hand and you rub it up and down your arm and allow it to dry and it gets absorbed. 
You can also put the estrogen up in the vagina itself. The advantage of that is that you um, have you deliver the estrogen to the vaginal area so that the vaginal dryness goes. It also helps with the bladder symptoms. Um, it doesn't get absorbed. So if you're worried about systemic estrogen, you can just give it into the vaginal area where it has benefit. And as I say, there's always the oral contraceptive pill. So if I just show you the different types, up in the top left-hand corner, you can see that is the patch. Very discreet. Most of us put the patch either on your lower abdomen or on your buttock area or on you, you can put it on your thigh. We tend not to put it higher than the waist level because we don't want it near the breast. Top right-hand corner, you can see that's the estrogel. You spray a blob on your hand and then you rub it up and down your arm in the morning and you can do one or two pumps or you can do up to four pumps a day. And that estrogen gets absorbed through the skin. Down on the left-hand side is the little ring that you can put up into the vagina and it can stay there for three months and that provides excellent estrogenization to the vaginal area and then we also have vagifem their pessaries that you can put up the vagina some people though just prefer tablets and as you can see the tablets you can take the reason there's two colors is because they are estrogen that you can take on its own for the first two weeks and then you take the estrogen the progesterone together and that mimics a natural cycle or some tablets, as I say, if you are more than a year after the, after the last menstrual period, you can take the estrogen and progesterone together and not have a menstrual period. I like Livial. That's the tablet there in the right hand corner. I take that myself because that contains estrogen, progesterone and it's get, got testosterone. So we've got some and that helps with libido. And as I say, progesterone, again, can be taken either orally or it can be taken by patch, or it can be taken in the coil. So for instance, this woman here on the right-hand side, she's got her estrogel in her left hand, which will be the pump that she'll pump two pumps a day. And at night, she'll take a eutrogestion tablet as part of the protection of her endometrium. And again, I guess a lot of us like the Marina coil because this is a contraceptive coil, which also has its license for protection of the endometrium. So a woman can have the marina coil put inside her womb. That coil provides progesterone that protects her endometrium. And then each day she can either take an estrogen tablet or she can take a progest or she can take an estrogen patch. She can apply twice a week or she can put on a pump a day or two pumps or three pumps and that gets absorbed through the skin. So what I often do is suggest that the woman has the Marina IUS put in and that makes her bleed free and it protects her endometrium for five years. And then she puts on a patch twice a week. And then if she needs to top up because she's got some breakthrough hot flushes, she can put a pump of estrogen gel on. There's been a lot of talk about testosterone replacement women do report low libido in the menopause. And we think that's because they're not producing testosterone either from their ovaries. Testosterone is typically a male hormone, but us women have it as well. At the moment, there is no licensed preparation in the UK for women. So we are using testosterone replacement off license. And most of us um, provide women with small little tubes or sachets of testosterone. Men would apply five of these tubes a day. Women are providing are provided with those tubes and asked to put an eighth of that on every day. So they'll get through one tube either over eight or 10 days. So minuscule amounts, and they apply that just to the inner upper arm once a day. But it is quite controversial but I've seen many women get very distressed by the lack of libido. It affects marriages. Men don't think um, that you love them anymore if you don't want to have sex with them. And um, using testosterone really can reverse that lack of libido um, that occurs in, in the time of the menopause. Um, the other issue that we have at the moment is bioidentical hormones. There is a big private industry in providing women at great cost with what's known as bioidentical hormones. These are not available through the NHS. These are made up in private pharmacies from various types of natural estrogen and progesterone. 
we don't know, there's no regulation. We don't quite know what's in these, but women are seeking private providers. And particularly up in London, there are a number of people who are making up natural hormone replacement therapy in the, in the back of the clinic, or perhaps um, they are providing women with lots of pots of various different hormones. And I know that women are coming through to the NHS and asking to be provided with these. We don't have bioidentical hormones in this form on the NHS, but we do provide women with natural estrogen in the form of the spray, in the, the pumps, in the patches. And also we provide them with micronized oral progesterone. But you will hear a lot about bioidentical hormones. And I'm afraid the science just isn't there and the regulation at the moment in the UK and worldwide is not there for bioidentical hormones. And um, we know that at the moment, um, the NHS is providing what I believe to be the right form of HRT um, that is fully regulated and has gone through the rigour of scientific um, appraisal in the form of clinical trials. So I'm going to stop here. I've raced through that because I know that you're going to have lots of questions. And I really want to show that HRT is complex, it's, it's, but I think it should be provided in primary care. And I think all women should have access to HRT and they should be aware of both the short and long term benefits. Thank you, Anne. So whoever's recording, if you please stop the recording, we can do the uh, questions and